What's up guys, my name is Quinn Kavanaugh. This will be my second video analyzing a movie, and today I'm going to be analyzing Midsummer. I'm going to be connecting it to the Me Too movement, which has some surprising connections actually. But first I'm going to go into the or overview of the film in the background. Directed and written by Ari Aster, Midsummer separates itself from other horror movies. After his feature-length film debut success of Hereditary in 2018, critics were excited for Aster's future films. Not even a year later, Ari Aster had the idea of writing a Swedish slasher film. According to Aster, he had no real way into the story regarding the plot. So he made a film, a horrorish, surrealist breakup story. This plot stuck as the overarching drive to the story. Contrary to the typical paranormal horror, the horror of Midsummer runs along the lines of a cult-like thriller with the creepiness embedded in the Harga community, which is the Swedish community, which the characters travel to. Their trip is college-based and is more of a background uh, and background finding of their cultures in Sweden and you know what they what they do so I would, I would give midsummer more of a psychological horror categorization because of the constant distrust and unpredictability of the characters in the film the story puts the viewers who are most likely not familiar with swedish and european customs in a sense of uneasiness to what such a foreign community like the harga will hold inside the folklore behind midsummer was actually mixed in with english german and swedish traditions to create customs that are similar but yet different for the film. This melting pot of cultures mixed in with the European hilled setting made for a pretty believable movie. Most of the film was actually filmed just outside of Budapest due to the stricter Swedish filming laws, and most of the film is filmed in the day. Some scenes on early on though were, were filmed in New York City and in Utah. Asser teamed up with Be Real Films to produce the film then distribute it through A24. Budget at $8 million, the movie did a good job of grossing $48 million in box offices. However, it still fell short of Astor's first film, Hereditary, and their $80 million box office performance. That was just a year earlier, too. The cast was star-studded with the blooming lead of Florence Pugh, beside the Transformers actor, Jack Raynor. Ironically, Pugh and Raynor put in an American dysfunctional couple, as both actors were Irish. This acting duo seemed like the perfect pair to show off what a toxic relationship looks like. 2019. A toxic male is sometimes unstoppable and manipulative in a relationship, although the jealous behavior can be from men and women. At the time of the movie's production, society had found another voice for standing up for women. These abusive relationships could come to a close with the Me Too movement. With the justice women have found during the same year of filming Midsummer, whether it's being freed from a dreadful relationship of jealousy or calling out a predator, Director Ari Aster seems to put his own surreal horror spin on the movement's motto. Similarly, some characters' actions in the film display the toxicity and abuse that celebrities are being caught for. But before we talk about how the Me Too movement relates to Midsummer, let's dive into some relevant facts and information about the prominence of the Me Too movement inside of the place where actors and producers spend their most time. Hollywood. Inside the golden, untouchable California hills, we're going to talk about some of the bad behavior of two figures whose money couldn't keep them safe. Prominent members of Hollywood, Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby, were sentenced to at least a decade in prison for rape and sexual assault charges within a year of Midsummer's release. After being a juggernaut of producing films, Weinstein had become one of the most powerful men in Hollywood. He was swimming in money. He was at some points in his career, any kind of critique about him could be a risk to whoever would complain. Emotional trauma and manipulation was a big part of Weinstein's string of acts. He guilt trip and pers persuade women into sleeping with him and then threatened to erase them with his status. On the other hand, we saw famous comedian and America's dad, Bill Cosby, accused and found guilty for drugging and raping women. When Cosby was accused, his defense is that the accusers were just trying to lynch him as if all the women were white. They weren't. Another aspect of his defense was to doubt the women's case, calling the accusers liars and slut-shaming the fact that they slept with Cosby while drugged. Part of the Me Too movement, which gained traction in 2017, 
pursues and catches these big name celebrities who were once able to get away with the heinous acts and assaults for years before and then reporting them to the authorities. Manipulation and gaslighting can be sifted through the excuses that the predators made. It took Harvey Weinstein over 20 years of success and awards to finally be called out and caught for his actions. He even tried to gaslight society itself into thinking, since he pioneered women in directing films and starring in the roles, he said there's no possibility he could commit such a crime. Not only can the Me Too movement take down the seemingly untouchable celebrities, it can set free anyone who is being abused in a relationship. These important years offered justice and a voice for survivors when no one believed them. The movement of Me Too not only exposes the abusers, but it opens up a floodgate of questioning to when and how sexual assault and violence can be reported. Social media has helped many people with smaller voices get their message heard to a larger crowd. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we've even seen the big celebrities call out other celebrities since 2018 and 2019. The Me Too movement disregarded money and socioeconomic status, and still does. Others could be caught no matter the platform or influence they had. Actors like Kevin Spacey and Louis C.K. also were accused of assault and pedophilic behaviors causing them to be annexed out of their roles in Hollywood. Both men and women can find the strength to stand up against their manipulative behaviors right as it's happening, instead of bottling it up before letting the trauma completely break them. Justice can be served and called out so a manipulator like Weinstein or a partner gets caught after one offense and not decades of abuse. The Me Too movement gives the abused a team of understanding instead of feeling like your back is against the wall. Now let's connect the power of standing up to a toxic partner in a relationship to our movie Midsummer. How could a horror film eliminate and counter manipulation within a relationship? So I'm going to tell you how that happens in our film. Let's go. I think of the Me Too movement when I see Danny, our protagonist in Midsummer, who is manipulated and mistreated by her boyfriend Christian throughout the film. She starts holding on to her boyfriend more because he's all she really has for support. After losing her sister, mother, and father in a murder-suicide, Danny is left to mourn with Christian, who's unable to comfort her. He has this inability to respect her sadness and emotions as the months pass since the deaths. Danny is left to push her emotions aside to please him and his friends, who have already turned on her just so she could hold on to the one thing that has been constant in her life for almost four years relationship. When Christian reveals to Danny through his friends that he's going to Sweden for his thesis, Danny is left to question why he didn't tell her before. Through the conversation, he gaslights her into thinking it's not a big deal that he bought the ticket and told her the same day he was going. In reality, Christian didn't care to tell her that. He's been planning this trip for months. Christian eventually tells Danny that she can come with, and Danny feels kind of like that was the last option for Christian. So the couple eventually goes to Sweden, and more cracks start to form in the toxic relationship. When they get to the Harga, Christian seems very distracted. He doesn't remember how long he and Danny have been together. He forgets her birthday, all while he eyes up another Swedish girl in the Harga. He shows no emotional attachment to his long-term girlfriend of four years. The buildup of disregard for a significant other feels more like a mental act of violence than a sexual one. But like how it took decades for Harvey Weinstein to be caught for his actions of sexual violence, it took four years for Christian to be punished for his poor treatment of Danny. The community of the Harga acts like the movement of Me Too with its communal aspect of support. They're there for Danny when all this stuff happens and Christian doesn't really treat her like his long-term girlfriend. When an act of violence or mistreatment occurs and is shed light onto the public, even with the doubters of the violence, there's always someone who will understand you and believe in you. This is what happens when Danny found the community of the Harga. They saw how Christian was not invested in Danny, and made it clear that he was not a good partner. So how is Christian punished in the Swedish community? And how does his girlfriend, who's been mistreated, find justice by the end of the film? Well, I'm going to show you how. I'm going to show you how it all unfolds. In the ending scene of the movie, 
It's the grand finale where the Me Too movement and the movie's plot draw several similarities. The conclusion of the once in every 90 year celebration sacrificial ritual during the Midsummer Festival is a moment that was built up through the entire movie. In a fairy tale ending described by Alyssa Wilkinson of Vox, Danny has the choice to randomly select a member of the Harga for a sacrifice or choose her boyfriend. Drugged up from the Harga, Christian is left in captivity to potentially be the final sacrifice. It's a Harga's ritual to sacrifice one of the outsiders, but the last sacrifice is specifically Christian, one of the Harga. The decision comes down to the May Queen, Danny. Right after Christian cheats on her with a Harga girl, it seems only right that Danny will have the choice of sacrificing her boyfriend. Danny did in fact catch Christian looking at the Harga girl he got with at the end of the film in the very beginning of the movie. But it took the power and confidence that Danny gained from the Harga to find the strength to stand up for herself. In a justiceless community without accountability, Christian might have gotten away with mistreating his girlfriend who needed his support. The days of mistreating your partner, though, in a relationship are harder to replicate in today's society. The final straw of Christian's BS was him being caught with another girl by Danny as the conclusion to what Christian is as a man, classless. But like the Me Too movement, Christian, the abuser, has no room to run away from his mistake. The Harga shuts down any excuse or escape from his actions by drugging him into a state of paralysis. He's unable to move and is put on a pseudo trial in front of the whole community. After being chosen as a sacrifice, he's put in a bear carcass. Like going to a court hearing, Christian has the guilty spotlight on him. Just like how Weinstein was hunched over and ill during his trial, Christian was also crippled. There's a parallel in the helpless conditions of Christian and Weinstein. There's no doubt that Christian was guilty within the Harger community, because Danny chose him right away to be sacrificed. The years of suspected manipulation and inability to portray his emotions in support of his girlfriend all burns down. Pun intended. Weinstein also succumbs to the abuse and sexual assault he committed with being sentenced to life in prison. Like Weinstein, Christian pays for his abuse, and with his life being sacrificed, he can no longer commit it. He's placed into the yellow building alongside his friend's corpses. These corpses, the friends, who thought Danny was crazy because of her emotions, they're left to burn, just like Christian. His friends, although, did not display their toxicity inside of a relationship, but broke rules within the Harga. They died because they took pictures of sacred artifacts and peed on ancestral trees. The yellow building acts as a prison system for the rule breakers and the sacrificed. It's a place where someone like Weinstein cannot commit any more crimes. Both abusers, Christian and Weinstein, have their lives taken away from them. With a community of support behind Danny, she's found justice and peace in the death of Christian. The sentencing of Harvey Weinstein is parallel to the sentence of Christian. Obviously, Christian did not sexually abuse or rape Danny, but he did mistreat her. It's an extreme way for Danny to find justice, but she did. The flames symbolically chew up the bad inside the building, turning a new chapter onto Danny's life, post-trauma. The Me Too movement could be seen in a similar light as the Harga, who also publicizes and condemns the mistreatment of partners in relationships. The Harga knew Christian did not treat Danny like a partner should, and he wasn't loyal to her. That's why she had the option to kill him in the end. The outcry and hysteria from the Harga in front of the building, behind Danny, is a portrayal of the exhaustion of the relieved, yet saddened crowd of individuals and their family watching their abused family member slash friend find justice. It's a relief to know that someone who has been abused can be set free. Just like the audience watching this movie, an adjourned sentence to a sexual predator, the feelings of Danny getting justice are bittersweet. Danny can't help but crack a smile to see her abuser go down. It's a peace only a victim can feel when the aggressor is caught. The scene was an emotional one to watch. The cries from the Harga are definitely weird and exaggerated, but it acts as another form of relief within the victim's family. In a sense, the Harga acts as a family themselves in their expressions of emotion. Bryn Ramella of Screen Rant talks about how Danny's ending smile is one of a mental health break, one that an overwhelmed individual might find in the conclusion of a toxic relationship. The abuse, the trauma, and conclusion to Danny's abuser is one that isn't familiar to regular audiences. The sinister smile adds to the creepy, fatal ending of our strange journey to Sweden. 
It also shows how worn out Danny is. It's a fresh and liberating sentence as she watches Christian burn alive with the wails of emotion behind her. It's a scene of ups and downs. The reaction reflects Danny's mental state by the end of the Midsummer experience and how skewed her perception is from her boyfriend's abuse. Showing Danny finding justice gives the audience hope that other women can escape their traumatic experiences and find the light. Christian's final fate is similar to the death of these accused and predatory actors' careers. Reviews were really mixed on the film of Midsummer. It did well in box offices, but some critics point out the multitude of social dynamics that were only briefly discussed. Some could have really used some more depth. Racial dynamics between Josh and Christian and the Americanization of the incoming college students from America would have thickened up the movie's theme even more than it already was. But the main point discussed in reviews was the revenge arc of Danny's blooming feminist realizations, which put the other social dilemmas on the back burner. Through a toxic relationship, Danny does go through a liberating spiritual awakening. Audiences love the woman lead killing a toxic male in a satisfying fashion. Many people can relate to times where a partner can be manipulative and lack support in times of need. Give a fresh new outcome instead of a traditional male survival ending. Critics praised Florence Pugh's delivery of lines with her deep raspy voice sealing a legendary performance. Pugh talked about how her memorable performance was propelled by mental abuse of the film's process. In a form of method acting, she wrapped herself inside of Danny's traumatic life to bring this character into her true potential. There were some differing reviews about the predictable plot. David Edelstein of New York Magazine says the fates of the characters painted on murals were foreshadowed from the very beginning. To him, the movie felt like the American characters were just set up to be killed. He also disputes that Danny becoming the May Queen was a foregone conclusion. I disagree because of the foreign setting giving viewers an uneasy feeling on what is going to happen. When you're not in an environment that you know, it seems like everything is just some surprise to you. If the roles were reversed, and a plot about a Swedish student studying in an American town for a thesis would then have made the film a little bit more predictable. But since we aren't familiar, it just feels like a big shock when everything happens. The customs are not ours. We don't know what's going to happen. But each review gives different perspectives, but they all agree that the unorthodox setting and plot still is entertaining. Midsummer puts audiences in a foreign place, a dark film in the bright daylight. The audience sees that the horror within the film is not some beast in the shadows, it comes from the humans. The closed off environment with an American audience invading the scene just nudges the viewers that something will go wrong. Sure, if you nitpick the subtle foreshadowing on the paintings inside the Hargis buildings, it might be directed toward a fallout of the main characters. These details are harder to find than some extreme critics point out. Moral issues are easier to sniff out and discuss because of the heavy implementation of societal problems within Danny's character arc. Astor hints at the Me Too movement's impact through the toxic relationship between Danny and Christian. With a nod and creative ending and a great performance from Florence Pugh, the movie leaves you scratching your head and begs for a rewatch. This analysis of Midsummer was brought to you by no one except a few articles that I used, which I'm going to share now. I'm going to link to all these articles in the description, but I used a few articles from Vulture.com, Hollywood Reporter, uh, and a YouTube video by Ribera Bonbon. I think that's how you say it. But I'm going to link her video in the description. I used Vox.com, Roger Ebert, Screen Rant, The Guardian, Daily Beast, and CBS News. If you haven't noticed that you're going to catch a lot of details in watching this movie again, and it really begs for another rewatch, like I said before. It's one of those horror movies with a lot of layers, and it was really fun watching it a second time and picking up on things I hadn't picked up on before. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, like, subscribe, send this to your grandma, and let me know what she thinks, you know? But yeah, I'll see y'all maybe. Hmm. Subscribe.